Hello, BookTube. I've got a tag for you today, uh, and it's a tag that's right up my alley. It's right in my wheelhouse, as the kids say. Uh, I could scarcely have refused to do it. Uh, it's the ratings and reviews tag that was created by Gunpowder Fiction and Plot, and I was tagged by Hannah at Hannah's Books, uh, whose response to this tag was, was very, very good. Uh, of course, Hannah is a book reviewer, same as me, and this is all about reviewing and rating books, so I was fascinated by her answers. Also, I watched Mark Nash's video that was wonderful as well. If I remember, I'll leave links to both of them. Uh, and I want to jump right into the questions, but first I want to make sure that we understand that there are a couple of silent suppositions, a couple of silent implications running throughout quite a few of these questions. The, the softer of the two is, I think, just a generally a general unawareness of just how many books are out there, about how many books are out there, how many variations on the exact same theme is are out there. <laughs> uh, which, if you if you reviewed a lot of books, I have reviewed thousands of books, paid book reviews for audiences, thousands of them. I've written thousands of those kinds of reviews, and I've also written at least ten thousand non-paid book reviews for a venue that will give me good exposure, though that's hosted by friends of mine. Perfectly happy to do that. That adds up to an enormous body of, of book reviews. And I can attest to the fact that there's nothing unique under the sun. Uh, and that you might think that's obvious, but it comes into play in a couple of these questions. And the other supposition lurking behind these questions is an old bug boo of mine from this channel and long before there was a book tube, which is the idea implied that uh, it's all subjective, that there's no such thing as an objective book review, that there can't be. Uh, I argue that that is nonsense. <laughs> Whether or not you like a book is entirely subjective <clears throat> and inviolable. Anyone who says you shouldn't like something deserves to be shown the door. <laughs> it, but the, the actual merits of a thing are not all subjective. Assessing them is not all subjective. Uh, obviously, a book is a human endeavor. It's a human act. It's a thing that humans make. It's not the one and only exception, the one and only thing humans make that cannot be assessed. Of course, that, that is ridiculous. It can be assessed, same as anything else. That has nothing to do with your enjoyment of it. But saying, you know, who's to say whether this is good or bad, it's all subjective, is just nonsense. Uh, it's, a, it's a human act. It's a human product. So it can be assessed, and and this is the part that ruffles people's feathers a little, I think. I'm not quite sure why. If it can be assessed, then it follows, as night follows day, that if someone has a huge amount of experience assessing it, they will be better at assessing it than someone who doesn't. Again, this does not touch on what, on what you like and don't like. But... If you show me a contemporary novel or the latest history of the Habsburg Empire or the latest history of a particular massacre that the Nazis conducted, chances are I will have read a great number of books covering that exact same ground, doing that exact same thing. You show me a new contemporary novel about a marriage in distress, about a, a family dealing with a kidnapping or a a child coming of age in a, a rough school, I will have read 1,000 books just like that. <laughs> Examples like that. Now, that doesn't mean I'm jaded. A critic who is jaded ought to hang up their pen. They're useless. They're poisonous, in fact. They're worse than useless because they're not neutral. They can hurt. They can only do hurt. They should just stop. They should just quit the profession. I'm not jaded. But that doesn't mean I'm not experienced. And I just wanted to mention those two things ahead of time. The vast ocean of books that are out there, the fact that you are encountering a new novel about upper middle class Connecticut divorce does not change the fact that I have read 4,700 novels of upper middle class Connecticut divorce, and I remember them all. I reviewed quite a few of them. That naturally is going to work into play here. That and also this nonsense about there being no such thing as objective book reviewing. Uh, there are subjective elements, there are preferences that that critics have, but uh, anyway, the, 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 neither one of those are focal points of many of these questions. I just wanted to get them out of the way ahead of time. So we'll just go on to uh, uh, to the prompts. And prompt number one is tag folks, and my answer is no. <laughs> I don't care what kind of a fad this tag is written in, in bootlicking obeyance of. You tag people at the end of a tag, not the beginning of a tag. 
whether it's a book tag or whether it's tagging people on a playground. You tag them at the end of the tag. The tag is the thing you leave them with. <laughs> you don't start with it. Uh, so no, I'll tag people at the end. Uh, so prompt number two is how do you know you've just finished a good book? Is it a thinking or a feeling response? Naturally, I'm going to say uh, that even the stuff that you think is a feeling response is really a thinking response. Uh, because a book is not a person, right? It's, a, it's, again, a human artifact. So it's engaging your thoughts. Uh, but now, that having been said, I have had books work on me quite a bit. I've had, I've had books stay in my thoughts and twist and concern my thoughts long after I finish them. Uh, the main thing that I'm looking for, this, this prompt seems to be about uh, the word just, that you've just finished a book. This, this prompt seems to me, anyway, to be about immediate responses. And for me, the immediate responses have to do with what I mentioned, which is that no matter what it is that I have just finished, I have probably read, no exaggeration, a good 1,000 previous examples of that thing. No matter what it is, I've almost certainly read 1,000 examples of that thing and probably been commissioned and paid to review several hundred of those of those 1,000. So when I finish a book, my just reaction is uh, boredom. How am I bored? Did I see anything that was, I don't need it to be new, but interesting, energetic? Is there anything that sat up? I, in my life with uh, my fellow critics, when they've come over here for Wine and Calzones, I always mention it as an electric shock. A charge in a book that you know right away. Usually you know right away that it's there. And the reason that it, that it exists at all, the thing that it exists in opposition to, is those many, 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 many times that you've read the same thing. Is there a, a snap to this latest example of that thing? And that's the thing, if we're talking about an immediate reaction, that's the thing that I look at first. If I'm aware of that snap, then I, I view it as my job as a critic to anatomize that. My awareness of that snap will never be wrong. Uh, it can't be. Once you have a sufficient mind-boggling amount of experience, you won't miss that. You won't, you won't miss when a new novel that is a post-apocalyptic, you know, <coughs> adventure story or uh, uh, YA falling in love story or whatever, once you've read enough examples of whatever it is, hundreds of examples, thousands of examples, when you read an example that is actually singing for its supper, that's actually working, you'll know it right away. So that feeling, I don't need to ponder to know whether or not I think that. What po The pondering comes from figuring out, okay, that was definitely there. Let's figure out where it comes from, where, how specifically is that coming about? And ordinarily, because I read everything as if I'm going to review it, I just it's just a habit. Once you get into it, you never get out of it. I read everything like I'm going to review it. So ordinarily, I already know. Ordinarily, I've already pinpointed certain things, certain places, certain characters, certain maneuvers on the part of the author that are the basis for that snap. That, but the snap is crucial. If it doesn't have that, if it's just flat, if it's just tedious, uh, then my initial reaction won't get any better. <laughs> uh, uh, question number three is, when you begin to form your review or rating, what is the first question you ask yourself? I love this question. Uh, some critics that I know, I'm not sure uh, if it would be true for Hannah. I'm not sure, for instance, if it would be true for Olive at a book, Olive. Uh, but some critics that I know don't start reviewing the book until they're finished reading it. They literally hold that process in abeyance, in a cloud above their head before, until they're done with it. Uh, I don't get that myself. I am reviewing a book from the first word. Um, and so a, a lot of review judgments are, are stirring around and fitting, you know, I plunk something down here on page 30 because it looks like that is something the book is definitely doing. And also it looks like this is the exact skill level at which the book is doing that thing that keep in mind, I've seen a thousand other books do. I'm not interested in whether or not they're doing it because I've seen a thousand books do it. I'm not looking for anything new. What I want to know is where is the skill level at how it's doing that particular thing, whether it's dialogue or character development or even scenery drawing or anything like that. And at page 30 or page 40 or page 70, I will put a marker down and say, all right, now I think I know 
about the skill level the author is doing that thing. So now I'm going to look for other things. I think I've got that down, and I will, I will of course, watch in case the author gets even better at that thing. I've had that happen. Uh, but the very first question that I ask myself when I'm all done with that, when all of those markers are in place and I've got all sorts of marginalia and I've, I've got the facts down and whatnot, the very first question that I ask myself has to do with readers, with my readers. I have a readership. You don't write this long in so many venues without developing a readership. And I think about them, and the very first question that I have to ask myself because of them is, do I understand what I just read? <laughs> do I know what I just read? I at the very first, before I do anything else, I have to know that. Not only in order to tell them, but in order to have a very firm basis for telling them about the thing. For my readers, I need to tell the readers what it is that we're talking about. But then I need to talk about how it's done. So the first question when I'm done is, all right, uh, let's say I just finished a 600-page uh, novel uh, about a man who leaves his unsatisfying Manhattan law firm and through a series of events becomes an unelected dictator in a small South American country. Okay. When I'm looking back on that book, I've now finished it. Now it's time for me to clothe my thoughts to or organize them and write a review. When I look back on that plot, is there a section of the book that's still sort of murky to me? What was going on there? There can't be anything like that. There can't be any section where I'm not really sure. It, was, it seemed that for a little while there, 30 or 40 pages, it shifted to second person. And the, the tone seemed to change. And then it shifted back. And I was happy that it shifted back because that's the rest of the book. That's how the rest of the book is written. So I didn't really think about it at all. But wait a minute. No, no, no. That's fine as a reader. But as a reviewer, I have to understand what that was. I have to know what's going on. It's uh, all the more time consuming and all the more important in a work of, if you're reviewing a work of nonfiction. Because the author is going to, in a work of nonfiction, the author is going to state his facts as facts. They often aren't. <laughs> you and you cannot fall for that. You have to. You have to be on the alert all the time. Which is my. If I'm reading a nonfiction work on, uh, uh, I don't even know the persecution of heretics in northern Italy, in the heyday of the Inquisition, something like that. If I'm reading along there and something pings, because keep in mind, no matter what it is, even a book on the persecution of heretics in northern Italy in the heyday of the Inquisition. I will still have read 100 books on the subject, almost certainly, or at least 20. When it comes to a new book, a new biography of James Madison or Benjamin Franklin, I will almost certainly have read everything in the author's bibliography. So if I'm reading a book like that and something pings, where I'm reading along and saying, wait a minute, that's wrong, well, I'll either chase it down right at that moment or I will leave a note for myself when I'm done so that when I'm finished, the first thing I will do will be to interrogate those question marks, whether it's a piece of fact in a nonfiction work or a murky period in a novel. What was that whole business with the second cousin and the vacuum cleaner? I have to understand that before I can talk about it. So my first question is, did I understand what I just read? <laughs> did I, do I understand it? Do I possess it completely? Uh, and question number four is, do you do star ratings? Why or why not? I do not do star ratings. And the reason why not is because if you don't like if you don't like reading, then why are you looking up star ratings on books? <laughs> if you want to know what I think about a book, then you want to know what I think about a book. A star rating is thoughtless. It is a brainless thing. It is designed to eliminate the nuances of your reactions to a book on the part of the person who's receiving it. They don't want to hear, well, I don't want to know what you thought about it. I just want a star. I want a rating. That's all. I'm just looking for a rating. And what good is a rating? Unless it's done in the aggregate. So not only are the people who want star ratings looking for you to pith all of your nuance and just give them a star. Don't no no don't bother talking to me about the good and bad parts of the book, the strengths and weaknesses. No, just give me the star. Not only that, they're also looking for the mob. They're looking for an aggregate. <laughs> and they don't want just one one person's star rating. They want to know what the average star rating was, and the higher the average of readers, the better. Antithetical to the whole process of discussing books, the whole, certainly the whole process of what we're doing here on BookTube. Uh, so, no, I don't use star ratings at all. And I would urge you not to either. You can love Goodreads. God knows I have... I want to, to be more present on Goodreads. God knows I do. I will try again. I will... I, I, I try every year. 
to be more present on Goodreads. It's where the readers are, and uh, there's a whole bunch of great stuff. It is a fantastic community. And I would urge you that if you love Goodreads, you can decouple it in your mind from the idea of star ratings. I hear so many people on Goodreads, who, who are on Goodreads a lot, complain all the time about the tyranny of the star rating system on Goodreads. Well, don't use it then. I have a Goodreads account, and it has lots of reviews on it, and I've never given anything a star rating. You can skip that part. You don't have to give a star rating. You can just give a review. And you should. <laughs> but anyway, uh, the follow-ups are on the either side of that, do you or do you not. Uh, and uh, A is, if yes, explain your star rating system. I don't. So we'll go on to B, which is no. If no, what language do you use to convey the quality of a book in your reviews? Uh, does this form an informal ranking or rating? Uh, I don't quite know what these questions mean, these, this subset of question four. The second subset, if no, seems to me to imply that uh, any answer to the subset A that isn't yes is a lie. <laughs> and I'm not lying. I don't use a star rating. So th this seems, the, 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 uh, the questions under subset B here seem to be what our lawyer friends in a courtroom would call leading the witness. <laughs> I don't use a star rating system. It's not like I use a star rating or a rating system of some kind and I'm trying to hide that fact. I don't actually use one. So uh, what language do you use to convey the quality of a book in your reviews? Well, I write in my reviews in English and I use adjectives and adverbs. Uh, and they vary in, in a case-by-case -case basis according to each book. So I don't think I know what is meant here unless it's trying to ferret out that the that the person answering the question is lying and that they do really use a rating system no my language doesn't constitute a rating system at all it's language <laughs> it's not it's not math it's language so i will describe a book i will say what worked well in it and what didn't what what resonates and what doesn't what is convincingly done and what isn't all that sort of thing but that's not a rating system in any way i am i was not lying in my original answer uh Prompt number five is, do you believe every book has its perfect reader? Does this contradict the idea that a book can be bad and bad is in air quotes? And here we have uh, the perfect meeting of the two unspoken suppositions that I was talking about here. The two unspoken suppositions were one, a kind of general unawareness of just how many books are out there, just how many mind-boggling number of books are out there, and also uh, the fact that bad in this question is in quotation directly looks at the other supposition, which is there's no such thing as an objective review, and by extension, that there's no such thing as an objectively bad or good book. Uh, you should take the quotes off the word bad. Books can be bad. Many, many books are bad. Close to 500,000 books are published in America alone every year, and out of those, 499,000 are bad. <laughs> so, so uh Books can be bad. Not bad, but bad. <laughs> and I know this because I read a huge number of them every year. Uh, and, no, and as a result of that, I say absolutely not. No. Every book has a perfect reader? No. The only way you could think that is if you just don't know how many books are out there and how bad a lot of them are. And that was true even before the size of the book market in America which is my bailiwick, uh, was at least doubled, maybe tripled, by independent, by self-publishing. Even before that was true, you could, I could easily, with confidence, say there are so many books out there that are so irredeemably bad that even their own author isn't their ideal reader. It, the, the idea that there's an ideal reader for every book is no, is absolutely wrong. And if you don't believe me, I could certainly supply you with tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of books that are just bad. They're just horrible. They, they could not have a reader who would like them even as a guilty pleasure. And that was before self-publishing. With self-publishing now, as Amazon will tell you in some of their ad material, you can have a book published in 15 minutes. Uh, so no, <laughs> no, uh, not every book has its ideal reader. Uh, and that is because plenty of books, an ocean of books, a fire hose of books are bad. Not bad in air quotes, but bad, objectively provably, demonstrably bad. <laughs> and books like that won't have an ideal reader. Uh, 
number six, a prompt number six is what book that you hated have you recommended? I have never recommended a book that I hated. If I hated, again, this question seems to be working on the smuggled in supposition that my hatred could be subjective, <laughs> that, that my hatred must be subjective, that the book could actually be great and therefore recommendable, even though I hated it. And that is not true. <laughs> if I hate a book, you won't like it. If it's not my cup of tea, if it doesn't get along with me, if I have my objections to it, I might talk about it with you. I still wouldn't recommend it because in every one of those cases, there will be a book that does the things that would recommend it to you better. In every one of the cases where I would be, I guess, confronted with the possibility of recommending a book I hated, there will be, as I mentioned, almost a thousand previous examples that I have read that I didn't hate, that did the same things. So I'm never going to have recourse to recommend a book that I hate. Instead, I'm going to have many, many, many examples of the same kind of thing, in other words, the same target of recommendation, that I didn't hate. Why, if, I, if I'm hating the book, then I'm hating it for a whole bunch of reasons. <laughs> why, would I, why would I recommend a book that I hated? <laughs> no, so I've never done that. Uh, prompt number eight, or uh, number seven is, what makes a book good, bad, or great by your evaluation? Again, I want to note the little nod here towards the supposition that it will only be by my evaluation. It won't be any other way. That I could, if I call a book great, well, it's all subjective. You know, it's just my evaluation. I think it's, I think it's cute how persistent these suppositions are throughout these questions. But if I play along with the question, uh, number one is, is it tedious? Is the book boring? Is it complacent? Is it arrogant? Is it expecting that I will venerate it? Uh, is it inconsistent? Is it factually wrong? If we're talking about nonfiction, is it factually wrong? That's not a complete deal breaker. Historians that I know can get plenty of things wrong. I could still recommend the book. They can also be ethically wrong. And I could still recommend the book. I would definitely give that caveat. But it would, even if it were true, I could still recommend the book in some cases. Uh, for instance, a famous example from oh, probably 30 years ago now is the historian Stephen Ambrose. Uh, you can, if you Google him, if you look him up on Wikipedia, you will see there were controversies next to his name. Some of his books are still very, very recommendable. They're still very, very good, uh, just with that caveat. Uh, so, you know, what would make it good, bad, or great would be based on the hundreds or even thousands of previous examples of its kind that I have read and critically assessed. How does it measure up to them? Does it snap even in that company? A uh, perfect example that I mention all the time on this channel is uh, Stacey Schiff's book about the uh, about Cleopatra, her biography of Cleopatra. Uh, although I could say the same thing about her, her book on the Salem Witch Trials, but let's stick to Cleopatra because I remember vividly my reaction when I read the advance notices of that book. I thought, oh, come on. This is one of the most written about people in the history of the world. And the sources haven't changed in a thousand years. So what on earth? <laughs> what on earth are you going to do? Is this going to be an in the footsteps of Cleopatra type thing where you you walk around and give stories about going from Wadi to Wadi in Egypt? But, and that's it. You're not actually contributing anything new or insightful to a biography of Cleopatra. And then <laughs> I had read all of those Cleopatra biographies. And then I read Stacey Schiff's book and was blown away, absolutely blown away, uh, with it a perfect example of that kind of snap, even though it did nothing new. It had nothing new in it except the author's performance. Uh, so that's the first thing that I, the, the main thing that I want to look for is, you know, does it have that snap? Is it is it new? in the sense of the energy that it brings, even if it's covering old ground. Is it interesting? Is it not lazy? Is it not pat? Does it have none of that in it at all? There's no fat on the bone of Stacey Schiff's Cleopatra. It doesn't, even if the fill-in chapters, the background chapters on uh, Antony or on the Republican Rome, they read with incredible amounts of energy. And I could say that about a lot of things as well, right? Doris Kearns Goodwin. Her book on the bully pulpit uh, is terrific. There's, it, it just hums with energy from beginning to end. So that would make it a great book. And, and in my mind, because I've read other books on that subject, that time period, a lot of those same historical figures that just sit there. Uh, 
then let's see here. Prompt number eight is when evaluating the quality of a book. I'm surprised quality isn't in air quotes. I'm just, I genuinely am surprised it's not. Uh, when evaluating the quality of a book, do you have specific criteria or aspects of the book, such as character development, that you consider? Does this change if you are writing an in-depth review versus just thinking about the book for enjoyment? Okay, well, the second to answer the second one first, I, I think critically about everything I read now. I just, I, I don't, I don't turn that off. I don't really want to. I think critically about everything, whether I'm going to review it or not. Even if I'm reading a new book that I know for sure I will not review, I'm still thinking about it that way. I just enjoy it better. It, it's, to me, it's just more enjoyable a way to read. Uh, but in terms of the first uh, question, uh, I think about all of those things. I absolutely have to because if I'm, especially if I'm going to review a book, I know that some readers are looking for some things and some other readers are looking for other things. I've got to cover as many of those as I can. I don't can't cover them all uh, because I'm not writing for the New York Review of Books or the London Review. I don't have 4,000 words. I only have 800 words usually or less. Uh, so. I, I can only, I can cover some of those things, but the working, moving parts, absolutely. Like, for instance, uh, if I am reading uh, for review some contemporary novel, and let's say I'm 150 pages into this 300-page novel, and I'm realizing, I realize by that point that the author is mainly considering dialogue between the characters as simply a way for, to just demotically tell you what they're saying to each other. The dialogue isn't an emphasis of art for the writer. They're putting their emphases elsewhere. Well, if I know that, then I can downplay talking about that in the review, right? If, I, if the dialogue is good, not boring, not bland, just uh, workmanlike, then I can pass it over in favor of the places where the author is putting their attention that are maybe going to be more prominent in the reading experience of the people who read my review, uh, if that makes any sense at all. If the author is, is only barely nodding at, for instance, place description. If I finish the book and I realize, okay, well, the author obviously didn't care much about place description, but also the novel didn't need them to be lavish. So although the author didn't care about it, the author didn't have to care about it. If I finish the book and I realize that, then I also will not care about it much in my review because I'll have other things to concentrate on, the things that the author was concentrating on, where it'll be my job, since the reader will notice those things, it'll be my job to, to point out that the author was concentrating on this instead of that, and then assess how they did it. Uh, so it, it could be any number of the factors that are alluded to here, but it won't be all of them. Uh, prompt number nine is, do you consider star ratings or average ratings when choosing books to read or add to your TBR? No. No. Absolutely not. An aggregate? A mob? is a way to choose a book? No, no. I'm a little bit of an outlier here, I would imagine, from most people who would answer these these questions because uh, I have a remit. I have a Bailey that I, a bailiwick that I that I stick to on my own, which is new releases in the American book market uh, in fifteen or sixteen genres. the the genres that I that I generally like, the genres that I've read a lot in or that I read myself. Uh, and when it comes to that, maybe I'm not the right recipient for this question because I wouldn't take even, I think it's going to come up again, I wouldn't take even expert star ratings or reviews on those things because I view it as my duty to read them myself. I don't need, I'm not, I don't need advice on whether or not I'm going to read the new uh, Douglas Stewart or the new Joshua Ferris. I don't need anyone's advice on whether or not they thought it was good enough to read, if that makes any sense. Th I, those, that is the kind of reading that I mostly do, and in that case, I am I am self-directed. Um, then, uh, yeah, this is going to come up again a couple of times. Number Prompt number 10 is, who on BookTube does reliable and interesting reviews of books that you know you can use to decide if a book is for you or not? What makes their reviews so good? Uh, nobody. There isn't anybody. I don't. I don't let anyone else decide whether or not a book is worth my time. Whether or not a book is for me, I let the the the, the it's the bailiwick that I've set out for myself. I let the genre. I let the new release itself decide that. If there's a brand new release in European history, in the American book market from Basic Books or Saint Martin's or or you know uh, W. W. Norton or whatever, then that is what will determine whether or not I read it. Just the fact that it exists. It won't be that I'm looking around saying, well, what are other people thinking of this? That, that doesn't happen. And, and it's not a slight on BookTube. It doesn't happen anywhere. 
it doesn't happen in the rest of the critical world either. Uh, and then uh, prompt number 11 is, uh, do those booktubers use different language than you to evaluate or review uh, the overall quality of a book? And again, here, uh, I, I don't use booktube at all to determine whether or not I will read a book. But that doesn't mean I don't get influenced by booktube quite a bit, especially when it comes to older books and rereading. That happens often. And there, I, I love the the, uh, the wording here, Do use different language than you. I love that wording. That's really thought-provoking. Uh, and it often is true. Uh, but I don't know that it's the language. Uh, because nine times, 9.9 .9 times out of 10, the book that some booktuber is holding up and saying, I just read this, uh, it was it came out in 1975, I, I have a whole bunch of thoughts about it, here's what I think about it, nine out of 10 times, 9.9 .9 out of 10 times, I will already have read that book. Then the wonder of booktube, it's not so much book reviewing, it's just reminding, really, or dusting off an old impression. I've lost count of how many times that's happened, where somebody on booktube will start to talk about a book that I read 30 years ago. They've just discovered it. They weren't born 30 years ago, and that much less reviewed it for, for you know, the Times Picayune or whatever, for $50. Uh, th they've just discovered it. And my first reaction so many times, it's happened four times already today, my first reaction is always, oh, yeah, yeah, I read that book. I already know what I think about it. And then I listen to them, and I start thinking, well, okay, you thought about that a long time ago. They loved it. And they're talking about this thing they noticed or that thing they noticed. Maybe it's time to reread that. I've lost count of how many times BookTube has made me do that. And I'm very, very lucky in that not only do I have the time, so I have a kind of expandable TBR. I don't do anything but read and take care of my little bean. But also I have the means without going online. I have the Brattle Bookshop here in Boston, which has a gigantic fire hose of stock replenishment every single day of every single week of every single year. So if somebody holds up, uh, what was the a recent example? Well, of course, there was Tom Robbins from Will's Infinite Library. You can bet the next time I see a Tom Robbins novel, I'm going to pick it up, uh, even though I read, I read all of them as they were coming out and reviewed two of them. Uh, for venues that no longer exist, for little venues that no longer exist. But there was another example. What was another example? Uh, oh, it was uh, Mark Richardson. It was on Richardson Reads. He, on one of his amazing book hauls, I don't know how he does it, he gets in the big red truck and just finds boxes full of books. Uh, but on one of his hauls recently, he held up a Michael Axler book, an Outlands book. Axler wrote a gigantic series of post-apocalyptic hard as nails, action-oriented, fairly brainless novels, but they had an incredibly energetic fan base, what we would now call a fan base. Uh, and I read one of them, Once Upon a Time, and was not disappointed at all. Thought it was uh, it was pretty smart for the kind of thing it was. And then I just forgot. There are, the hard, there are dozens and dozens of these things. I remember the, the cover design that got me interested, the cover design that I noticed, is that for a long time the Outlands books had... Uh, foot-oriented cover design. It was, there was something that was on ground level. So there was a boot with a rattlesnake right there, or a boot with a, with a scorpion right there. But there, were, there weren't even torsos, let alone heads. It was just feet. <laughs> and I, so I saw that and thought, you know, I, I, that's a settled book in my mind. And even so, seeing it makes me think, what would it be like to read that again? And that happens all the time. All the time. That influences a lot of buying that I do at the Brattle Bookshop. Uh, so I don't know if that's the exact spirit of the question. They, do they use different language? Often it's a case where the booktuber in question, I don't mean this to sound horrible, but often it's a case where I, I won't be paying scrupulous attention to what they actually say about the book. Instead, I'll be thinking, okay, this is a reminder to you that this book is still hooking people years or even decades after you have settled your opinion on it. So maybe it's time to unsettle your opinion on it. Maybe it's time to go back to it. I love that. Absolutely love that. But I don't know that, I don't think that's exactly what the question is asking. I don't go to BookTube for explicit book recommendations. You hold up, you, you do a book haul, you go to your local used bookstore, you come back with 15 books, you hold them up, chances are, 
or you, you've just read a book that you got from your library or whatever and you, you want to enthuse about it, chances are that something along there will prompt me to revisit the book. Uh, but it won't be your review thoughts that will do it. I don't, I don't mean that mean that sound insulting. It just, it won't, it won't happen that way. It'll happen because of you as a person rather than you as a critic. Uh, and then we get to the end of the tag, which was the beginning of the tag, which is to tag people. <laughs> uh, and I want to tag all of it, a book, all of it. She'll do this. I would love to hear it. I think I know a lot of her answers. Uh, I want to tag Criminali. He's doing quite a bit of uh, very quick book reviews on his own channel quick because he has instituted a satanic challenge that has influenced a number of people on book two, where he has said, read 100 of the books you already own before you buy another book. 100! Uh, but he also has a fantastic channel, and he reads a lot of unapologetically schlocky stuff, quite a few of which are blasts from the past for me, just things I haven't thought about in 30 years. So, so I'll tag him if he's interested, he wants to do it. I'll tag Vin at Revenant Reads, and also Jennifer at Insert Literary Pun here. No idea if she watches my videos. She does occasionally make mostly cat-oriented videos of her own, but she's a very good critic. I'd love to hear what she says about these things. Uh, and there you have it. That is the ratings and review, the ratings and reviews tag all about rating and reviewing books. So keep in mind, you can do this even if you don't review books, because even if you don't review books, you almost certainly rate them on, on Goodreads, right? So uh, you have, you have even if you don't do either of those things, you do it yourself. You do it in your own private life. We all do. You're always rating and reviewing the things you read, somehow, in some way. You don't just uh, let them pass through you like gas. <laughs> so, so I would love to hear answers from anybody here. A, lo a lot of the answers will be thought provoking for me, no matter what. Uh, but those are my own, uh, a, a little bit inexact because I have a whole four hour treatise that I could do on the art and science of book reviewing. Uh, but these were great. So uh, thank you very much to, uh, to Hannah for tagging me. I have a feeling she must've known she was going to get a long review, <laughs> a long video on the subject. God knows she's been subjected to very long conversations on the subject in person. Uh, but anyway, I'm going to wrap this up for now and I will still try to have a tag tomorrow on tag Tuesday, even if I have to make one myself, uh, but I will see you soon. Thank you book two.